We are on Ephesians 5, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, raise your hand if you need a Bible. I will have it up here as well, but if you would like to, to have a book at hand, we have plenty of Bibles along the way here. So what I think I'm going to do then, I think I'm going to... Did you get through the 25? Did you, in, in, in all seriousness, did you finish chapter 5 or not? No. No. So how far did you get? Did you get to 22? Is that section or not? How about just for fun, I'll start at 22. Okay, so this is 22. And I'm going to read 22 to the end of the chapter because these things really, truly have to be heard together in order to make a lick of sense. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spots or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and see, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Alright, so we got a bunch of, a bunch of, um, I'll, I'll say, uh, see red words. And this section is <laughs> words that, um, at, at best, are uh, hard for us to wrap our brains around as 21st century Americans, and and at worst are uh, are just are just plain offensive. So let me let me see if I can uh, unpack this in a way that makes sense. Um, and in order to do that, we have to start by recognizing. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So, kind of first off, you have to remember what Paul's purpose is here, and how Paul has approached the whole question of how Christians live together, or live for one another. And earlier on in chapter 5, we had that whole, this whole section begin with submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So you have this kind of broad picture of, uh, I'll say, of mutual service to one another. That we are to serve one another. That that's what it means to be a human being, basically. To be human means to love one another and to care for one another and to put yourself quite intentionally, under the authority of another. Okay? Now that's, a, now that's a really strange concept for us as, as stubborn, fallen human beings, but I think particularly as Americans. Because in America, it's, everything is about power and control and independence, and, and to put yourself and equality. and equality, at least, sort of. if, if, not, if not actual <coughs> over another. So, so what Paul is presenting here is, I, I would say, radically countercultural. <laughs> it is not radically countercultural, however, in a um, in an Amish way, in, in a way that, that means if things were now just like the clear
believers, <laughs> then everything would be perfect. Was it radically countercultural in this time? Uh, you mean in the believers' time? No, I meant the culture. Okay. Well, that's a that's a good question, and I think that I would that I would say it again. We're talking very broadly speaking. Um, certainly, Paul lived in a highly patriarchal society, no doubt about that. And that and that you and that there's also no question that that men were usually in the position of power here. Okay. So the countercultural part to this is actually uh, not the wives submit to your husband part. It's the husband sacrifice yourselves for your wives part. That's the radically countercultural part to this. Is that husbands love your wives as yourself? He who loves he who loves his wife loves himself. That's the radically countercultural part. Is that everyone presumes that a wife would be um, subservient or submissive to her husband because she had no choice. Because you're thinking in terms of power and control. Okay? So it's very easy to think in terms of power and control when you're the one holding the power and control. Right? It's much harder when you think in the other way. So the radical part that that Paul is really talking about here is, first of all, what does Christ do for the church? He gives himself up for her. He cleanses her with his own blood. He washes her and makes her and makes her clean and spotless by sacrificing himself. That's the radically countercultural part of this picture. And that and that is the <coughs> pardon me. That is the part of this whole picture in this chapter that is usually um, either ignored <coughs> um, or sort of um, glossed over in some way or another. So that's so that's kind of the big the big lens that we have to look at this whole thing. That we're first of all talking about a mystery, you know, which we knew because we're talking about men and women. And that's a mystery, that's for sure. But this is the mystery of Christ's love for the church. That's the mystery. Is the relationship between Christ and the church. Why is it that the church submits to Christ? Because he gave himself for her. Because he, because he sacrificed himself for her. So in other words, the church submits to Christ... Because Christ has proven that he is trustworthy. So, I have died for you. So, when I say this, I am not saying this in order to belittle you. For example. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's absurd. Right. It does seem, it is absurd if kind of understood in that context. Now, the, the problem, of course, and this shall come, is no surprise to any of you, is that the husband, the human husband, is not Jesus. <laughs> and it is not perfect. In fact, it is far from perfect. And so we're dealing with an imperfect image or picture or pattern, if you will, of Christ. That doesn't mean non-existent, but that means that it is an imperfect pattern. Okay? But in order for us to kind of wrap our brains around all this stuff, we have to recognize what the, what, what's, the, what's the comparison. The comparison is Christ and the church. That because Christ sacrifices himself, completely gives himself over to his bride, the church, and is completely un and utterly loyal and faithful to a fault, and would, and would never do anything that would, that would harm her. Because if that's who Jesus is, therefore, the church submits to Christ. That is to say, listens, hears his word, receives what he says as for her benefit. That is for the church's benefit. And he even, and he even goes on and kind of uses some of this language that we have used already 
uh, in here in Ephesians, we are members of his body. So he kind of he keeps using this, this very organic language to talk about the relationship between Christ and the church and our relationship to one another. That it is very um, that it is very organic. It is it is intrinsic, it is inseparable. You're not simply talking about you're not simply talking about an organization or an institution. Okay? In an organization or an institution, now this is what this is what big companies do all the time, is they go through a reorganizational structure. And they and they'll have a revisioning of of their identity and they'll come up with new and fancy and amazing ways to figure out how to relate to one another. And you know, chances are a lot of it's cool where it's from a marketing strategic development person somewhere. Um, but the, the idea there is that an organization can be reinstituted, it can be refashioned in a different image. Okay? That is not Christ's bride. Christ's bride is not a um, is not an institution that can have a new flow chart put in place <laughs> so that everything relates together, you know, in this new and radical and different way. We're talking about an organism, a, per a person, a body, not. Uh, not a thing or some arbitrary structure. I mean, this is so. This is kind of how Paul is. This is why Paul is using the members of. We are members of his body. We are members of one another. Is that the relationship that he's describing is is organic? It's it's not it's not just um, it's not just willful. It's not just a matter of you know. Okay, I have signed <coughs> on to the new strategy plan that I'm no longer going to talk to boss X, I'm going to talk to boss Y before I talk to boss X, or whatever. So that's kind of the big picture here that has to be in place. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions along, along these lines? Kind of before we get into a little more of the details. Yes, Levi and then Walt. Yeah, I think this is one of the, obviously, kind of highly controversial mm -hmm. But um, I've seen it kind of go both ways. It's interesting how uh, Christians will try to deal with this today. Is either you have kind of outright denial or say, oh, this is a patriarchal attitude. Yep. Of and we've, we've progressed from that today. Yep. Okay, that can be or, you know, I've, I've seen actually what I've seen more of um, in kind of my circles is almost an overreaction the other way, where it's like, not only are we going to, you know, completely affirm this, we're going to make this like an agenda for how our church is going to behave, you know, and um, we see that like, I don't know if anyone's familiar with like uh, Mars Hill up in Seattle, sure. um, where it was this very hardcore kind of patriot, like if you, if your wife went to work, you were very looked down, you know, mm -hmm. that, that sort of thing, so. It, and I would call that the Amishification of the church. Yeah, in a weird sort of way. I just made that yeah. word up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just wondering like, you know, that how do we... You know, where is the, the freedom as Christians that we have? You know, I mean, what, what is Paul saying as far as, like, he's not saying women should never get a job. You know, right. or, or something in like fact, that. In fact, that's not even, that's not on the radar <laughs> at all. Yeah. That is, it? that is so totally the wrong question. Yeah. That, that does not, that, that's just not here. And that's, but that's important. But that kind of gets, uh, thank you, Levi, because that gets at why these verses are so weird for us today, and and how is it that we as as Lutheran Christians can kind of make sense of this stuff, um, so that we don't end up like the Amish, nor do we end up tossing out Paul's epistles as being well, you know, that obviously can't be part of the Bible anymore because I don't like what it says. You know, I don't really have that kind of. I don't. I don't know about you, but that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> that's for sure. Walt and his cat. Like, uh epistle verse, they were baptized in the Christ, for Christ yes. so yes. this works right, Christ is in the church, and church is in Christ, that's yes. the way it's supposed to be. Yes, okay. it, is, uh, it is organic, that's, I mean, that's, that's very intentional language there on my part, please. So, is it actually that these verses really aren't 
talking about our relationship to one another as husband and wife and men and women at all until we get to verse 33 where he says, however, you know, it's like the whole thing is really about Christ and the church. And then it's almost as if he's realizing, okay, you people are probably going to take this to me and blah, 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 blah. And yes, this is true. And, and this is true that you should love your wife and your wife should respect your husband. But I'm really talking about the church of Christ. <laughs> Uh, here's how here's how I would would try to look at that, and th this is something that we are. I would argue we are going to be facing more and more and more and more as the years and decades roll by from here forward. <clears throat> and that is how how do we approach <clears throat> moral and ethical questions? Because the way that I'll put it this way, the way that social conservatives tend to approach moral and ethical questions is very simple. No. Now what's the question? <laughs> I mean that's that's how we tend to argue. That's how we tend to think. Is is that if something is a change, it must, because it is changed, by definition therefore be wrong. Now I have to figure out what what how precisely are you wrong? <laughs> I may not know how, but I'll figure it out. That's how social conservatives tend to think and operate in these ways. And frankly, that's not sufficient. That's not enough. That's not right. It's not helpful. And so it doesn't matter if you're talking about the relationship between men and women, or abortion, or gay marriage, or uh, you know, freedom of religion. You pick it, any of them, saying, no, what's the question? doesn't cut it, <laughs> because that, that doesn't get at the why. <laughs> what, is, what is behind that question? And, that, and it may still be a no, but, I, <clears throat> but in order to get at that, we have to get at what is underneath the whole thing. And so what Paul does here, it, and this is kind of one example of many, many, many in the scriptures, is that is that he paints this picture that our our human relationships, as flawed and, and as imperfect as they are, our human relationships are a reflection of God's relationship to us. Okay? They're pretty attractive with me so far. So how I relate to my neighbor, whether I'm talking about my closest neighbor, my wife, or the guy down the street, or whatever, how I relate to my neighbor is directly a result of how I believe God relates to me. This is really important, so I'm gonna say it again. How I relate to my neighbor is directly a response, maybe subconsciously, but it is, nevertheless, directly a response to how I believe God relates to me. So when you refuse to love your neighbor, I mean, this is first John language here. When you refuse to love your neighbor, what you are saying is that you do not believe that God loves you. <coughs> I mean, this is straight law gospel stuff here, okay? So, how I relate to my wife is, as Paul quite explicitly says here, a picture, however flawed and, and kind of, you know, not the full picture, because this is not an, a complete reflection, but it is a reflection of how Christ loves the church, okay? So this is the relationship between faith and works. This is relationship between identity and and, and action. If you want to you want to think in those if you want to think in, in those terms, this is how these things kind of kind of work together. And, and this is why I get so terribly irritated when when we pull a a, a moral or an ethical issue, and I don't. And I really don't care what it is. <laughs> you know, you pick it. And, and we try to pull that 
and completely separate it from our relationship to God and how we and how we believe God looks at us. Because when I do that, when I kind of try to chop off that relationship from God to me and make this purely about you know how do I view homosexuals or how do I view the unborn or how do I view ecological questions, whatever. If I, if I separate those questions from how I believe God looks at me, what I'm doing is I'm making myself out to be God. And so that's why, ultimately, all of those things finally are first commandment questions. Our first commandment issues. If I do not believe that God looks at me with favor, of his son, if I don't believe that is true, if I, if I believe that God looks at me and says, well, get cracking, you've got a lot of stuff to do if you're going to get here, if that's how I think God looks at me, well, well that's kind of going to color how I look at other people, right? So that's kind of the, that's really the big question, and this is, and this is why this whole section is completely about husbands and wives and completely about Christ and the church. And it is not one or the other. It's got to be always both. Even, even if that makes it harder along the way than Mary. So he just won't think all of that just makes me, that, that, that makes me feel like I'm a terrible, 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 terrible person. <laughs> Um, but then it goes back to your sermon. You're beautiful. Oh, oh. 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 But I'm still terrible. <laughs> but it goes back to your sermon and recognizing that even, <laughs> even those terrible sins of mine, it is sin. Yeah. And it is forgiven. Yeah, it's sin. But it's just sin. I mean, yeah, and, and I don't want to, you know, like, you know, but because it, when you say that, it's like, oh, I'm horrible. This is, and this is why our relationship our to God and to our neighbors is one of constant renewal. Create in me a clean heart of God, a cat, and so forth. That I am continually renewed and remade because I continually fail. You know, every day we start over. Every day. And that's kind of the great gift of the Christian life is is no matter how big you screw up, God forgives you, and there's tomorrow. I mean, that's 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 hope, right? I mean, that's kind of I mean, that's kind of a big deal. That is Mary, and then Mary. So, this passage is a perfect message for all of us to take into the community this week. It's the way we should be looking at God. But this past week was really rough for the Christian community. Yeah. Oh, my oh, yeah. And I actually heard a pastor on TV stand up and say, well, this was written at another time. Right. Which totally throws the entire Bible out. Yeah, right. That's the, the, that's the to talk, toss it out because it's too hard for me to figure out. Well, and because we want to bend rules to make it fit what we think right. we want to believe. So we're, we're literally telling God, I'm not going to believe this, but I'm going to believe this over here because right. this works for my life. I'm making I'm making my own story up, right. and I'm going to use some of your words because they say what I want to say. But you know that's kind of like a reporter taking a quotation out of out of context because you know not that reporters would ever do such things, of course. But 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 that's that's exactly how we tend to view God's word. Is I'm going to take the parts that I like and I'm going to really try that to look over there. So how do we Mary. defend this this week? <clears throat> well, how do we? I mean, you can go out there and go, well, God wrote the Bible and the, this is what the Bible says. But then you go up against somebody who goes, well, well, first of all, um, and I, I, pre I, I presume that you're that you're talking about the Orlando shooting <laughs> and kind of the responses. To the Orlando shooting. Well, you have a you have a pastor here that's saying that 
what was that, 50 pedophiles died. Right, and right, and that this was the punishment that they deserved. It, it should have been more of them, right? And, and that was kind of under a too, wasn't it? As I yeah, said, I was in Indiana this past week, so I probably missed some of the fireworks here. Now, the Thanks internet's exactly. a lot slower in Indiana, so I just get it. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> when we are in the midst of a tragedy of violence, okay, regardless of, of whether we're talking, regardless of the cause, okay, to take causes out of the equation completely, because it doesn't matter what the cause is. All right, I'm very serious about this. There is. No place, no place in God's word that says you should only help people who are at least trying to be right or good. That's, that's total nonsense. That is not what the scriptures say. Be merciful. <laughs> it's what the scriptures say. You know, thinking of the, uh, the you know, thinking of, of the Good Samaritan from Luke 10. There is not one word in there on whether or not the Good Samaritan deserved to get robbed and beaten half to death. There's nothing in there about it. That is not the question. So that's kind of number one for me, is when we are talking about, about violence and, and hardship and these things, no matter what the cause, it's mercy. <laughs> mercy, always mercy. We can think about causes later. <laughs> But at that point, you have people that are hurt, that are wounded, that are in need, that need help. Period. And don't, and just don't go down that road because all it's going to do is inflame and anger and drive people away. Now, I'm not saying don't speak what the scriptures speak. Obviously. But my showing mercy to someone is what God does to me. <laughs> and God doesn't look at me and say, well, you know, if you were a better pastor, maybe I would help you out. God doesn't look at me and say, if you were a better father and were around more for your kid, well, then I would save you. You know, you're not even trying. <laughs> God, doesn't, God doesn't look at us that way. That is precisely the gospel. <laughs> you say God loves us. And so, and so that's kind of my first, first answer when I, when, when you kind of deal with these sort of things. And, and the second, the second is when someone, um, when someone starts to connect dots that the scriptures don't connect, cut them off. Because, I'm sorry. This is what the scriptures say. The wages of sin is death, period. So we should never be surprised when people die because people are sinners. Doesn't matter if it's in a shooting in Orlando, or they're dying in their sleep in a nursing home, or they get hit by a bus, or they die in the womb because of an abortion. The wages of sin is death, always. It's all the same. <laughs> we all deserve the same thing. We're all going to die. There's a 100% mortality rate, well, except for Jesus. <laughs> and so, and so that, that is real kind of straight up. And I don't have to kind of, I don't have to get into the, well, you know, this sin caused death, but this, this sin will only cause you to have a rash on your left foot. <laughs> what kind of craziness is that? But we do kind of ask that way. Especially when we act in judgment over someone else because we think that their sin is somehow more sinful than others. <laughs> so whenever... Whenever people die, for whatever cause, it is a time for us to repent and to and to hear hear God's mercy and show mercy and, and be less worried about um, about pointing fingers at the at the at this or that sin which they commit or may have committed. So that's kind of my off the top of my head rant about how to try and look at those things. And so if I if someone tries to paint me with someone that is that is simply being hateful, 
for the sake of being hateful, you know, you pick a Westboro Baptist or, you know, whomever, say that's that's not the God of the Bible. <laughs> Whatever it is, and I, I reject that claim on their part. And while I can't, I'm, I can't make them do anything, as much as I am able, I am going to show mercy and be merciful and ask God to forgive me when I fail. Because I don't know what else there is to do or how to, or how to do it. Does that, does that make sense? Is that a helpful kind of way of thinking about this? I mean, we've got to get out of the, my job is to make sure everybody knows what they do wrong. That's, that's not my fundamental identity, is to be the, the wrong point. I mean, yes, that is a part of God's work, God's message, right? His law. No doubt. Um, that does not mean that I personally have to have it as my quest to make sure that everyone gets that. That's a really depressing way to live, first of all. And I know what depressing ways to live are. <laughs> that's a depressing way to live. So that's that's kind of my rant on that little, little topic. But that's a that's a big one. It really is. And as more violence and death and, and hardship kind of comes across our world, and we don't have to leave our own neighborhood to find to find people who need mercy, right? <laughs> Hardly. We don't have to go outside of our own church to find people who need mercy because we all need to receive that mercy. And the more we're able to repent and believe the gospel and show that forth, the more clearly we're reflecting and confessing Christ to the world. And Rick, you were after Mary. Do you have your hand up or not? You don't have to talk. I mean, I'm not trying to make you talk. I, I did, but I'm going to go ahead and have you Wow, that's impressive. Danielle, unless there was another hand over there. I have friends that go to Barry Baptist, and I. I is trying to think of a way to reach out to them. Or, yeah. I mean, what, this kind of off, off topic a little bit, what do you do? I mean, why do you help them? Well, if you if, if you're reaching out to them in order to, in order to tell them that they're wrong, they're probably not going to receive that. <laughs> no. Because that's precisely what they've been doing, or what their pastor's been doing, right? Seems like he's enjoying. It. Yeah. And and. Neither we nor would I guess they have any control over what he says or does. My suggestion would be to reach out to them because they're your friends and to listen more than talk. And because it could be that they are just as confused and wounded as anybody else is. Um, but to go into a scenario like that with an agenda is probably not going to go far. <laughs> So that's that's how I would start um, if I if I had opportunity. Does that make sense? Just maybe like a how are you doing yeah. with all this going Yeah, on? absolutely. No you don't have again, no judgment, no you know, you don't have to have an agenda and you God does not need any of us to defend his law. <laughs> right? God God doesn't need us to do that. It's his law, not ours. And, and so that's, that's not my kind of sacred quest in life, is to make sure of this. God will see to it. Um, what God does call us to do is, is confess who he is and what he has done for us in Christ. Um, but we don't have to be the defenders like that, I don't think. Julia? Julia, right? I got it right? Okay. Um, I think it's called Martin Luther, and I don't know exactly. Yeah. Making really good shoes. And yeah. So I like that. I like to think of that quote when you're dealing with people, just showing them that you're, you know, these aren't works that get us to heaven. These are works that we do because Christ loves us. Yeah. Kind of thing, you know, doing well and it's just showing love to people often impacts them more than just yeah. being, being and showing love um, where God has placed you. That's Christian vocation. That's Christian identity. And that is actually what's going on here in Ephesians 5. Is, alright, so how does our identity in Christ kind of 
take flesh and blood in marriage, in family, in vocation, because this continues in chapter 6 um, along, along the way. There was another hand, John. Yeah. If God's forgiveness depended upon your forgiveness of others, how forgiven would you be? Well, oh, right. I mean, and that's a, wasn't that a part of the a part of the gospel from last Sunday was the, the parable of the, you know, for the, the one forgiven, forgiven 50, uh, 50 denarii, and then the others forgiven 500 denarii. So, I mean, so Paul changed the gospel lesson. Right? Oh, he did, that turkey. He is such a liberal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the gospel was supposed to be about Mary Magdalene and, and about she loved much for she was forgiven much. That, that was the, the appointed gospel from last Sunday. But that's, that's the picture, is if I try to measure and dole out my mercy um, based on uh, based on what I think somebody else deserves or doesn't deserve, what I am saying is, is that that's how I want God to interact with me. And that is not going to end well for me. <laughs> that is for sure. Yeah. Essentially, isn't Paul saying here to deny self? Yeah, that's, that's sacrifice language. Is that, and, and in fact, that is precisely what, what we have Christ as Christ Loved the church and what? Gave himself up for her. That is the, you know, if anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself and come after me. Whereas today, in the secular world, they're promoting self. Right, right. I mean, we live in a, we live in a culture that is, that is um, that really a, a very narcissistic culture that, that is very self-centered. And, and we are, make no mistake, we are all self-centered. You know, it's not, that, that is not pointing the finger at somebody else. That is a recognition of our human condition as, as fallen. So, that's the, so that's, the, that's the challenge here. That's the picture that we get here. Now, I do want to, uh, I do want to just take a, a couple minutes and look at a couple of these words. And some of these words I have... I, I have spoken about before, but, but just to kind of give us a quick gloss. And the first is that word submit. And, and you remember that that word submit is a, is a military term. And that, and that refers to your relationship in the chain of command. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Is, is. is that you submit to the authority, to the one that is placed above you. It's not. It's not a. Um, it, it's not a quality word. It's a function word. Let me let me try to explain that. So it isn't. Wives submit to your own husbands because they're better than you, right? Or you know to go up. Submit. Submit to one another. Because whoever the other is, is better than you. That's not actually what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So to submit to one another is to be Christ to another in a different way. Now on the one, you have sacrifice, right? So you have the husband gives himself up for the bride, sacrifices himself. In this other, you have you have putting yourself in the place of a servant. You know, think Philippians 2. You know, God did not, uh, did not think it, uh, Jesus did not think it robbery to become equal with God. He became, became nothing, taking upon the form of a servant. <laughs> that this is, that what this is saying is to submit to your husband is to, is to recognize that to submit to another is what Christ does in taking on our flesh and blood. That, that he humbles himself, taking on the form of a servant. I mean, that's, the, that's the language there. And remembering, too, you can never take this word out of, out of the context of the whole. Because just as the wife, in, in this example, submits to her husband in all things, in the same way, 
the husband is to love his wife and to give himself up for her and to sacrifice for her, even to the point of sacrificing his very life for her. So that is what this mutual submission looks like concretely in a marriage. So, so there are, I know that, and I'm sure John Paul uh, mentioned this last week, but you might know that men and women are different. You know that, right? Right, just check in. That, 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 I'm not going there. So, that God has created us differently. And while, uh, different, and so while we are, uh, we are all, the same before God. God has created us as his children. You know, he says in Galatians, as we get in the, in the epistle, the appointed epistle, epistle for this Sunday, you know, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, that, that we are all have this same relationship before, before God. It's called quorum Deo. But before the world or before one another, quorum Mundo, for one another, our relationships are different because we are created differently. And because we have different abilities and talents and skills in a different place. And so that is actually exactly how God has made us. And so to deny that, once again, is to deny God as a creator. And so this is so this is kind of what's uh, what's cooking through this whole thing. But that word that word submit, again. It's not a qualitative word. It's not a word term. It's a it's a chain of command or place or function term. Really, does that make does that make sense? And and I think that that's why that's one of the reasons why that word gets gets our modern hackles up. Is submit it sounds like a power word, right? A control word. You know, this is a, you know, when you're wrestling, <laughs> if you lose, you submit. <laughs> I mean, so it, it sounds like a power control term. Um, and what and what he's saying here is do this, do this willingly, not under force because of, because of love. Because of what Christ has given and done for his bride, the church. Yeah.
right? <clears throat> just, just looking. Yeah, I mean, and you look at that verse 22, it, it doesn't say wives submit to your husbands because they're such great guys. <laughs> or, because, or because they deserve it. <laughs> right? I heard that, Linda. <laughs> Um, but it, but it's, but it says, uh, but it is saying, you know, twenty-five husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. So this is this is a uh, this is kind of an absolute vocation. It's not based on on worth or how much how much the spouse deserves it or or anything. This so the wise response is basically like the church's response to Jesus: we're terrible. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, I'll... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I'm not going to judge it. So, so, you, so, yeah, you do have this, this sense, and, and we very much in our culture, of course, think in terms of, well, I'm going to do this because they did this, and it all just becomes this sort of um, back, and, back and forth tennis match of, of who did what, and so I'm going to react to them because they did this, and then they're going to react to you because you did that. And, um, and anyone who's been married for more than a day uh, knows that if you were to constantly keep score, everybody loses. Right? I mean, that is, that is just real fundamental. If you're keeping score of every slight and every wrong and every, and every good, everybody loses. Everybody. Because... Not about. It's not about that. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, in the trailer for this great. It seems like, uh, in general, the counsel you see from most pastors, even fairly conservative ones, sure. online, is to divorce um, in the instance that your spouse is not a great spouse. Yeah. And where does that sort of counsel? <coughs> like, if your spouse is a drunk or your spouse is a uh, Lazy, it doesn't work for right. Anything like right. Well, that's kind of a big question. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I am, in all seriousness, quite happy to uh, to talk about that and to think about and to think about that. Um, uh, I'm I'm not going to answer it directly. I will say broadly speaking, um, when we talk about marriage. Um, we're, we're talking about what is within your what is within your control or purview in, in how you love your neighbor and in this case your closest neighbor your spouse okay and it is it, it is much less so about how do they respond or what do they do and that's the and, and that I think is the tricky part or part of it at least when we talk about when we talk about divorce, is that is that divorce almost by definition tends to go right into the tennis match measurement. It, go, it tends to go right into the well, they did this and they did this and they did this and they did this, and therefore, you know, that nullifies our our marriage vows, whatever. Um, I don't really think that that's even how the scriptures talk about divorce. I mean, you remember, Jesus gives allowance for divorce. I'm not. I'm not saying that this is that that um, that that divorce is always wrong. I don't miss don't hear me here. But but I will say that before you can answer the divorce question and kind of talk intelligently about that, you have to get at that more fundamental: what is marriage? I mean, you've got to get that kind of clear in your head first before talking about the what is divorce, why does this happen, why does Jesus make allowance for it, and what, you know, in what context does this happen? Now that's, I mean, that's kind of my short answer to that, and I, and I fully realize that is a, 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 a very messy and, and sometimes extremely personal uh, challenge, but I'd be happy to talk about that at some point in the Bible class, if there's no All right, we're almost done, guys with what, is cap what we are capable of doing. But I'm going to do one paragraph in Ephesians 6, just so I can say we started Ephesians. 
6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I mean, I didn't kind of want to get to that first. <laughs> Honor your father and mother. This, is, this is the first commandment of the promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Father, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice again, it, 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 uh, it sort of cuts both way. Um, children are to obey their parents in the Lord, not because their parents are so great people, but because it is right. And there's that, and there's that great quotation from Luther in the Large Catechism. Uh, it's one of my one of my favorites, although it's becoming more personal in each passing year. Um, where where Luther says um, basically, you should learn to respect and obey your parents no matter how feeble or strange they become. <laughs> Not a great quote. I'll find it because it's a it's kind of person. So we will talk about uh, about obey and provoke. And, and my favorite words of discipline and instruction down here. Pastor, uh, I'm going to... I don't know what Pastor Pro's going to do for Bible class. He's a great teacher, so whatever he does, it will be, it will be great. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him the option of starting with Ephesians 6, but I'll also give him the option of doing a couple other things, doing something else for a couple of weeks. Um, and then uh, we will pick up with Ephesians for sure when I get back. All right, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>